Yes, welcome to our 155th KCOR uh, Zoom presentation. We're, we're honored today to have uh, Mike Fletcher from the City of Ottawa, and he's going to be uh, uh, talking about how some of the sustainability goals uh, of the city are, are intended to be met to reduce, uh, of course, greenhouse gas emissions, primarily from our buildings and from heating uh, hot water. It's, uh, it's a tough uh, job, of course, to, to do for an entire city. And I expect we should be able to hear what other cities are doing as well and, and how we, we uh, fit in with the, the rest of the, the, the major cities in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> Mike, of course, uh, went to the University of Guelph, got a bachelor's degree, and uh, <laughs> and he has a certificate in, in brewing. Excellent, you know. Uh, and of course, he joined uh, the city of Ottawa in the building engineering energy management group, and and uh, <clears throat> as has worked there in the uh, 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 with the city and driving toward the the need to contribute no more than. Uh, the city meets no more than uh, its share of the 1.5 degrees C for, for global heating. I'll be interested to see how you, you do those calculations. And with that, um, uh, Mike, uh, we'll, we'll turn the, the uh, presentation over to you. Here's your first slide. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Art. It's great to be here. Um, Yes, as Art said, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about our plan generally, and zero in a lot on community heating. Uh, it's an area I'm working more and more on, uh, and our section is working more and more on at the city. Um, it is uh, a really tough problem in cold climate cities, and uh, we're not unique in um, having you know having a real challenge um, dealing with how to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from heating. So yeah, please advance. Yeah, great. So um, I'll discuss our inventory, like the heart of um, being able to get to understand a problem is often it's to do the math. Um, and I'll discuss that. We we do an inventory annually. And then I just have five letters up here that say model. That's our uh, uh, emissions reduction model. I'll discuss how we develop that and how we use it. Um, and then I'll get on to discussing with respect to community heating, what we have to do. So there's, uh, yeah, no, let's move ahead. So, like I say, it's good to know uh, if you're tackling a problem, know the numbers. And um, uh, all our work has to align with uh, cutting emissions. So, a big thing you see here is all that natural gas. Um, and there's a bit of propane and fuel oil, and there's some electricity emissions that are related to heating. So, heating, I'll just say heating generically, that's you can think of that as being over 80% of that heat going to heating buildings and less than 20% going to heating hot water. Um, and so this is a really huge issue and um, something that requires some thought and some focus. And, and again, it's what I'll talk about today. We do this inventory, by the way, annually, more or less annually. Uh, inventories basically uh, are not that hard to do. Sometimes there's uh, there are questions, for example, this year, uh, there's been a question about methodology. Uh, methodology could affect how a percent or two of emissions in the categories might swing a little. Um, but, you know, when they do come up, there's a lot of sweating we have to do to make sure we're um, we're following a good methodology. And, and the challenge we have is that um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, tracking methodology 
is always subject to a little bit of improvements. So, you know, there'd be, for example, with a greenhouse gas like methane, there'd be reconsideration of how, just practically speaking, how potent it is and how much it uh, contributes to global heating. All right, so next slide. And this, this is what we show we need to do with emissions in Ottawa community-wide. And uh, you see back in 2016, we were close to five, uh, five megatons of emissions in Ottawa. Canada is about 700 megatons. Um, we're not a super high emission city compared to say a city like Edmonton um, or any city, many cities in Canada that are more industrial and or have higher emissions electricity are, are gonna be more, have more of a challenge than us. This uh, emissions profile was, uh, emissions reduction profile and plan was developed after 2020, um, excuse me, 2019, when Ottawa City Council declared a climate emergency and, um, and we went from having a target to reduce GHG emissions by 80% by 2050 to having a target to reduce them by 100% by 2050. This was what was mentioned in the introduction a few slides back there about how we work with the consultant GHG, um, the consultant uh, um, um, that worked with us. Um, and I'm having trouble with it. I'm having a little mental block with the name here. Uh, but um, Sustainability Solutions Group worked with us to develop this model. So what we did was between about 2017 and 19, we considered a bunch of pathways that would reduce our emissions and how much emissions reduction we could get from each of them. There are about 35 measures, everything from insulating buildings, switching buildings to heat pumps, switching transportation to uh, electric transportation, uh, encouraging more transit and active transportation, uh, renewable natural gas, all of these things. Um, and uh, so that's that's what allowed us to, they, they then took those pathways away and said, okay, how do we combine them, all these 35 measures, and do something that's effective? And um, the result of that is what you see here. And um, this is, actually in another view would have 35 actions, not five. So this, this is kind of uh, the actions kind of combined into broader categories. Um, and what you can see is that other than transportation, um, the other ones all have something to do with, um, with community heating. So as the electricity grid gets to have uh, fewer uh, GHGs implicated with it, it leads to some reductions. As we produce more uh, renewable natural gas, um, that that generates greenhouse gas GHG reductions for us. As we improve existing buildings, that of course affects it and the new buildings. One thing I think that's uh, that's interesting here. Well, let's stay on that slide. Yeah, thank you. One thing that's interesting here is, um, you know, in this scenario, and this is a scenario, um, the population on Ottawa will go from a million to a million and a half. However, you see that most of the strictly building related GHG reductions we need to do are not in the new buildings, they're in the existing ones. And that really reflects the fact that new buildings in terms of um, energy and heating energy performance have really improved. And our struggle is with older buildings. So anything from about 1980 and earlier, uh, a member of our team who works on, um, works on multi-residential buildings can show, you know, has, has graphs of um, energy demand, heating energy demand uh, for multi-res buildings by year. And once you get back into the 70s, the story gets really not too encouraging. We didn't, we didn't insulate buildings. We didn't seal them as well. We didn't do as well on windows, et cetera. 
back then. So that's why a big part of the problem is with existing buildings. And really part of the reason that heating is such a tough problem, um, and it's only part of the reason, is uh, just the cost of retrofitting existing buildings. So uh, that's a challenge. And I'll get into that as I'm as I'm doing my presentation. But I think that's an important takeaway from this particular graph and chart. So, yep. Yeah, next slide, please. And just uh, just advance. There's everything you need. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So the the hundred the model gave us a 100% GHG reduction scenario by 2050. And the first thing you need to do is improve buildings. And there's an order to doing the work when you're tackling emissions in buildings. It's better, always better, to reduce the heating demand of a building first. And anybody who's kind of worked on this knows there's some rationale to it. Um, if you improve a building a lot and then decide to switch off gas to say something like a heat pump, uh, you know, after you've improved the building, you're not into uh, needing perhaps, for example, a five ton heat pump, maybe you only need a three or four ton heat pump. So you do the improvements to things like building envelopes first uh, before you do fuel switching. And then in our plan, there's a massive switch to fuel uh, to heat pumps, and that's hundreds of thousands of them across Ottawa. It boggles the numbers do boggle the mind. Um, some of these will be ground source, many of them will be air source, somewhat driven by cost and location. And I'll I'll get into that a little bit further on in the presentation. And then uh, there's a big need for net zero district energy systems for 80% of large buildings. And um, yeah, maybe, yeah, that's good there. Yeah, for 80% of large buildings. And we figure in the process, we can also get 15% of small residential ones on um, uh, on net zero district energy systems as well. The impact, um, so the gas consumption needs to fall by 94%. Uh, all the, all must be renewable. That's what I mean by that is all the gas has to be renewable. We must be re relying exclusively on renewable natural gas. Um, and, you know, it's really for when it's most urgently needed. So. Um, you know, the two times it would be most urgently needed is when it's very cold and things like air source heat pumps are, uh, are challenged to provide enough heat and um, use a lot of electricity in the process. And also when there's, when there's power failures and we need to use backup generation. So those become the two big needs for renewable natural gas. Um, I think it's important important to note that it's renewable natural gas is um, is a kind of a limited commodity in the amount we can source and using it for things other than heating doesn't work in the model so you see discussion of using it for heavy fleet um, we we can't we can't see that in our model um, and that that doesn't make sense uh, from our point of view and, and that goes to one point that uh, is important to understand about our model is it's integrated. And a lot of the energy planning, most of the energy planning isn't integrated. It doesn't look at where, um, don't stay back there, please. Yeah, I'll just, yeah, I hope I'm all right for time. But yeah, a lot of the energy planning isn't integrated. Ours looks at where all the energy comes from and goes. Um, a lot of the discussion on how to manage and plan energy is siloed. Uh, municipal energy plans are the biggest exception. I would say the majority of them, and there are many of them now across Canada and other parts of the world, they are integrated. And ours uses um, uh, a model uh, protocols developed by the World Resource Institute at, that worked with a couple partners to figure out how to make integrated models. So. When you have an integrated model and you know that this resource needs to go there, uh, it's because the people have been doing that modeling and been saying, okay, what's the cost of this resource? How much of it do we have? So where does it have to go? And 
as soon as people come along with something siloed that's not kind of integrated and holistic and make suggestions, we're concerned because uh, again, if if you don't if you're not doing this on an integrated base basis, um, things potentially don't kind of net out, and then you you end up with kind of imbalances in what you're doing, and the whole task of getting to net zero would be more difficult. So, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, just pause there. Is that kind of clear on the integration integration bit? I don't see anything quickly. I'll just I'll just roll on. Yeah, I think we're good on that. We we've, we've done some modeling here in KCOX. Yeah, using meetings to see them, um, people. Hmm. Okay, good. So next slide. And this just. Um, this I often put in many uh, presentations to reinforce the need to improve the efficiency of buildings uh, before we fuel switch away from fossil fuels. So um, I remember early on when I got involved in the planning department doing this work, uh, somebody asked a question of a very large group said, um, said to them, um, um, offhand, who knows uh, on, let's say, during a big heat wave, what does the electricity system max out at, like four in the afternoon during a heat wave? And, and you know, of a room of maybe 60 people, 10 had a reasonable answer, had a, a number that was about right. Um, I think the number that God arrived at was about uh, across Ontario, that number is probably around 24 gigawatts. And uh, that seemed right. Everybody kind of agreed. And then the presenter said, how about on the building heating side and the gas system? On the coldest day of the winter, what does the gas system max out at? And uh, nobody knew the answer. Nobody, well, nobody was willing to ha hazard a guess, I guess. Um, and um, the answer is the answer is around 90 gigawatts. So it's, you know, it's it's over three times higher. Um, and so again, if if we don't work on the demand side and just fuel switch, uh, we'll run out of resources. And like in this example, what I'm trying to say with logging three times, uh, if we were to say it's all going to be biomass, uh, we would have to increase the amount of logging in Ontario about threefold. If it's all electricity, well, you know, we need Adam back at Niagara Falls. We'll need 20 more of them if we're all on heat pumps or maybe 60 more of them if it were electric resistance heating. And wind turbines, we have somewhere around 5,000 of them now. That range could be 100 to 300,000. And I'm not sure where you'd put them all. So uh, again, this shows the importance of, of really dealing with the demand side um, prior to dealing with the fuel switching side. So next slide, please. So there's, uh, there's a bit of the problems and here's a little bit more on the solution side. Uh, the city is doing a pilot deep retrofit at Hindenburg Community Center. Um, and that's, that's the gentleman you see there installing the window. And these are, um, R11 windows, windows as we have them these days might be, um, you know, existing ones might be two or three, four if you're really lucky. Um, and windows in a building with about average fenestration is about a quarter of the heat loss. So um, these windows uh, are in a few city buildings now, they're kind of cutting edge. Um, normally a city, is careful about doing cutting edge stuff because we can get into newspapers, but um, but given the challenge we have here with, with building heating and the potential uh, benefit we can have by going after windows uh, because they are a huge source of heat loss, you know, we started by piloting these windows in Glebe Community Center and then um, have gone a couple other places. And um, so these windows can actually be up to R18, which is, you know, pretty well the same R value as a wall once you get up to there. 
and uh, are really quite revolutionary. And if we can make them work, I'm very, I'm, you know, I'm um, very optimistic about using them. The other thing that looks promising on uh, having a half decent return and not being too capital intensive on doing deep retrofits is uh, just energy recovery ventilation. Um, you know, the passive house standard for that can go up to 90% energy recovery on the exchange. And a lot of big buildings, even ones that are not super old, are exhausting the air and then just using infiltration to replace the exhausted air, which is, you know, heat, heat recovery percentage is zero. Um, so back when we were doing building renovations, just to save costs as opposed to save emissions, um, energy recovery ventilation was something that would pencil out sometimes. So it shows how good that is. Um, I don't show pictures here, but we have done infrared analysis of buildings. Um, well, I'm interested in working on it a bit more. Uh, I think where we can use it to show leaks is good, uh, where it just shows um, straight transmission across uh, building walls and roofs. That's more of a challenge um, because um, dealing with that is much longer payback. So. We, we haven't moved to the point of, as a retrofit, putting panels on walls. Uh, we know a tiny bit of that is happening in Canada. We know a heck of a lot of that is happening in the Netherlands and Europe. We're kind of watching that. Um, in Germany, um, the German equivalent of Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation is really driving that in their multi-res buildings. Um, so they they are they're doing a lot of work on that, and in the Netherlands they're doing a lot of work on it on um, on public housing. For a while they were doing about a thousand units a week. Um, so when you hear numbers like that, you know that's like okay, that's good. They're they're getting on to about the rate that needs to happen to really um, deal with greenhouse gas emissions on a on a decent timeline. So yeah, so those are a couple of things of interest there. Um, next slide. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, district energy. And again, as I recall uh, on that third slide where we had the waterfall and the decreasing emissions to 2050, um, you know, we had about 80 points of emissions reductions from existing buildings versus uh, or 30 points of emissions reductions from existing buildings versus eight for new construction, even though we're going to have a lot of new construction. So the really the, the rationale for district energy systems is around the built environment, as I'll discuss. And, and the reason I show this building is, and unnamed and apologize in advance to whoever has this building, um, but it would be an example of me for for me of a building that is very tough uh, to retrofit and to fuel switch. And if you look at it, it looks kind of precast. You can kind of see lines in that that grayish stone. Um, so that's probably not very well insulated. You could probably do the windows and get some good improvement in the windows. Those balconies, those are how virtually all the balconies are in Ottawa. Those are pour through slabs. Um, those are just big radiators that radiate the heat out in the winter. Like I would assume that each of those fairly long balconies on a on a winter cold day is uh, is three tons of heat continuously moving out of the building. Um, you know, unless th there's no way to retrofit those. Basically, I mean, the, the retrofit for those is to um, get a demolition crew in and take them off the building, which isn't going to happen. So all this to say, this is going to be a hard building to improve. I know I said we want to uh, improve the, the building thermal energy performance by like 60 or 70 percent. I wonder how we do it on this particular building. It looks tough. And a lot of the older MERBs are a bit like this. They look pretty tough. And on the fuel switching side, you'd say, okay, we put a ground source heat pump in, but you can see how little space there is. And 
remember we haven't even done locates on on where the on 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 where the underground line goes um and and so it's you not don't have a lot of space for uh for geothermal uh, in the core of the city, we tend to do closed loop. We tend to use geothermal that requires a lot of space. And then if you think of an air source heat pump, that could be pretty tough too. Like this building probably peaks out at around 300 tons of heating. I don't know, you might fit that on the roof. I'm, I'm not sure, but it'd be a lot of equipment. I'm not sure if the roof is up to it. Um, so that'd be tough too. So. To my mind, I look at a building like this and I say, okay, what's our other option? Um, well, maybe the other option is to, to knock on the door and say, we're gonna put two or four pipes for district heating up this street and we wanna hook up to you. And um, you know, and I think that in, in many cases with older MERBs is gonna be um is gonna be a real need. Um Notwithstanding how far we can go, we will improve a building like this, but um, but still getting all the way there and fuel switching it without helping with the district system, to my mind, looks looks very hard. So, next slide. And this is just a schematic of what we think of with the uh, district system. I need to make my own for Ottawa, but. Uh, not there yet, but, um, and this just shows heating in this case, uh, but if we think geothermal, it's heating and cooling and other sources. So um, sewer waste heat in some areas will be good. Um, so that can be another heating and cooling source. And, you know, this is part of the way also um, that we get enough energy density, enough heating supply during the, the winter design day um, in in denser parts of the city. So this is just the one of this slide to just point out how how this basically works. Next slide. Yeah, so I discussed actually I did discuss the role for district energy uh, two slides ago, but um, thinking about how this works. So you have an area of the city that like lots of areas of the city that doesn't have a district system, what do you do? Well, uh, we've talked to other cities about this and Toronto's done good work and become, uh, to my mind, for a colder climate city, uh, although a bit warmer than Ottawa, but a reasonably cold city um, has done some, some great leadership and pioneering work in this area. So they found if you have um, a new development with about a uh, thousand square meters or a million square feet of new floor space, um, built a little bit better than code, though it doesn't have to be all the way to a really good code like Passive House, just a bit better than current code, then a district system, a net zero district system can get established. It has the potential to be competitive with gas. Uh, and that's important because I think, you know, as we're trying to expand a district system, if we go knocking on doors and say, well, we have some net zero district energy and it's gonna cost 50% more than gas, uh, that's that's gonna be a non-starter for a lot of people. I wish it weren't the case, but I think that's true. But if you can say it's competitive with gas and we can give you uh, a long-term contract so you know what your pricing is, then that gets interesting. So, What's what's key to understand here for us, uh, and that it's something again that the city of Toronto really helped us with, was understanding that um, although a new development might help get a district system in, established, uh, it's very important that everything be put in place so that it expands. So um, people who've gone back in the district energy world in Canada can, can give examples of places where district systems were installed and then they never grew. So, um, you know, they had newish buildings on a district system and they're super and the rest of the communities on fossil fuels for their heating and that's not changing. So we're really pushing ourselves to figure out 
how we can have district systems that expand once they're installed. This little outline, by the way, is um, um, the Gladstone redevelopment area. So that's between Gladstone at the bottom of the, the map, the highlighted area, and Somerset up at the top. And, um, and when we wrote the, the MOU with Ottawa Community Housing for it, we said that we will work towards getting in place a setup where the system expands into the existing built environment. So we hope we're working with a consultant now and we hope to have a concept design fairly shortly. What I wanna see is some of the trunk lines um, perhaps being a bit oversized or significantly oversized and you know having blank flanges on the end of them so that someday uh, lines hook up to them and they expand outside this area and they they hit some of the multi-res buildings, existing multi-res buildings in the area and, and provide the heat to them. Um, the struggles that we have, well, uh, one is just in planning. Um, I think if the secondary plan is done and, and a developer comes in ready to build something, we don't have much time. Um, so getting something together to say, okay, let's have a district system, um, that that is a real challenge. If um, if we can intercept what's going on, say when there's a request for a zoning change, well, that's a little better. That then then we do have time, and and we can try and make things happen. But if it's fairly far along, and of course, you know, no fault of their own, developers have to watch cash flow, um, so delaying them is is a big problem. And then. Perhaps a secondary concern, not quite as important as the first one, but it's just a place for the district energy node. So when I had that, that schematic a couple of slides ago on how a, a geothermal district energy system would work, there's kind of a hub for it. So, you know, in an area like this, we think we're gonna have a, a hub area that might be, uh, might be 80 square meters um, on this map. So we need some space for that. So that has to be somebody's land and um, the piping has to work. Um, so that has to get figured out. Not as big of a problem as intercepting the developments, um, but still a little niggling thing that, I mean, if it's not taken care of, then the development doesn't happen. So next slide. So that's what I have to say on district energy. Other things, I want to just talk about um, what the city has in terms of other programs to get things done. So overall, we believe that um, about 5% of um, GHG emissions are directly under the city's control through operations and services we run. Um, of the remaining, GHG emissions, like emissions that 95%, maybe half of them are influenceable by the city directly, and the other half are well beyond our control. Um, we can lobby a bit, influence and cajole, um, but um, but it's getting it's getting harder. So you know things like heavy fleet. We don't know how heavy fleet vehicles are going to develop. We don't have much say on that. Um, you know, we keep an eye on it and hope that hope that we can do something. To get back to the buildings that talk for today, we have a Better Buildings Ottawa and Better Homes Ottawa program. Uh, the Better Homes program is uh, what people in the municipal world know as LICs or local improvement charges. So spending to um, spending to improve, for example, your house. Um, can go against your property tax bill. And that's important because um, when people spend personal money, they wonder how long they'll be in the house. Um, if the repayment is through the property tax bill, they understand that if they move, uh, then finishing paying, um, paying off the, the improvements that were made uh, could be on the next owner or owners. So um, it takes some of that, takes some of that stress away. Uh, the benchmarking, we've been making good, good progress on the benchmarking. Uh, that's the, just the third bullet there. Um, and 
we believe that'll help. We got catching up to do like, well, the rest of the world is a little bit ahead of us on benchmarking, but, um, but it's getting there. So uh, very happy about our progress we've made, especially recently on that. Uh, next slide. And then finally, this is just other initiatives we have. Um, again, if you go back to my third slide there, where I had that waterfall GHG reduction um, area, um, uh, there's development of a renewable natural gas. So this picture is the um, two of the, the two biggest anaerobic digesters at the wastewater treatment plant. And they're making biogas right now. Um, and generally what we're doing with the biogas for the lion's share of it is making electricity. Um, in the future plan, uh, we've done one follow-on study on this and we feel that it'd be better to take that biogas, clean it up, take the impurities out, turn it into grid, uh, grid, um, grid gauge renewable natural gas and inject it into the gas system. Uh, when there's electricity peaks, we will still run the generation and make electricity, but generally we'll put that gas into the gas grid. Um, so that, that'll, be, that'll be a nice tranche off uh, our emissions. And it's something we can do relatively quickly. And really we wanna just get all the renewable natural gas that we can. Um, so that's, that's gonna be our plan there. Uh, we have programs for new and existing city buildings. I mentioned we'd, we'd put some of those very high performance windows into a few places. Those are kind of pilots. And what we'll follow up will be um, an update to the city's building renewal plans that uh, reflect deep retrofits that get them, um, get them GHG neutral. Um, and then of course, we'll update the, the plans for new buildings there is, a, there is a green building policy at the city. We'll update it. The existing green building policy is um, the traditional lead uh, silver, uh, which isn't really net zero. It's certainly better than nothing, but we need to update that to being, um, being GHG neutral. And the last item, the last bullet here, maybe doesn't sound like much. We gave input on conservation and demand management plans, but um, a bunch of groups recently gave input on the latest um, conservation and demand management plans for natural gas. Um, and I'll give a bit of a shout out to Pollution Probe and Environmental Defense in this case. Uh, gave a lot of input uh, at the Ontario Energy Board, and we got some changes that were really unprecedented. So. Um, traditionally, conservation plans wouldn't allow fuel switching. So if you have a conservation program for electricity, it's about using less electricity, not finding another energy source to use, electric, uh, use less electricity. Similarly, traditionally, a conservation plan for natural gas was about reducing the energy demand so you use less gas not about substituting another energy source. However, um, I would say with the, with the conservation, three-year conservation plan for gas that started this January, that had a complete sea change. And now the gas conservation plans will spend money uh, on installing heat pumps. And, um, that, that, like I say, that's just a complete change from where we've been before. Uh, and they will even allow uh, a non-hybrid um, heat pump application, meaning uh, the heat pump goes in and the gas account is closed. So they are no longer even a gas customer. Um, so, and that's done through the gas conservation plants. So I didn't think we would get that far. But uh, we worked with some groups and, you know, and, and City of Ottawa wrote letters to the Energy Board about this, uh, asking for it. And, you know, to be, to be very blunt, we got, we got quite a bit more than I anticipated in that program. And I think that's, um, that's something, uh, it's a case where the city didn't have direct control, could just influence and, and working with others, we did. And we made some great headway on that one. So very bullish about that.
And I see piles of questions coming in, Art. And uh, wow, I think that's my last slide, right? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so. All right, we're um, going to go through the question and answer. I'm going to take the prerogative uh, and ask the first question with John uh, Leg. You're on deck, and um, in your your planning process, uh, I didn't see any mention of microgrids and community microgrids. Have you given that any thought as a form of of alternate fuel or energy for for building? So, um, I mean, microgrids tend to be about electricity. Um, we we like microgrids to the extent that they'll help electricity um, become lower carbon. Um, but if you look at those raw numbers, electricity is about four percent of emissions, and building heating is about forty. So we certainly like the idea of microgrids and there's good contribution on the resiliency side um but it's it's less in terms of emissions so um you know thinking about where the emissions are uh, i think it's fair to say we have somewhat stronger focus on on building heating straight up uh as the route to lower emissions hmm. yeah well i i know that you uh have a ground source heat pump, as do I. Yeah. And uh, yes, it takes a little bit of electricity to run it, but it certainly saves a lot of greenhouse gas. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm just you know concerned that you're saying it uses electricity, therefore you don't pay too much attention to that. I I think that's a fairly significant um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, remover candidate. Oh, well, I mean, the electricity generally, um, yeah, sure. I mean, we, we um, the model includes targets for uh, local wind and solar and storage and, um, you know, has a requirement the electricity um, get to basically net zero by uh, 2035. So kind of in line with the federal targets. Okay, so um, John Legg, you, you can get your your audio and your video turned on, and we have Bob Jones on deck. Thank you uh, <clears throat> very much. First of all, Art, for passing me the floor, and Mike, uh, <clears throat> this is this is a very good illustration of a level of government which is doing things with the people. And uh, it's quite, uh, I find it very refreshing having come from uh, foreign affairs or as it's known these days, global affairs. But it's pretty uh, airy fairy, that is very high level. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't get your get things done on a, on a down to earth basis. So I, I looked at your uh, at your experience and uh, your current projects. And I will say that you really you really have a vast mandate. But uh, and, and it must be sometimes frustrating to not have unlimited resources uh, to uh, to get involved in many major project so the i had the <clears throat> perhaps unoriginal thought of developing uh, close links with community associations and uh, they i used to share the one uh, in sandy hill and i must say uh, i found that there was a lot of enthusiasm there for many, many types of projects. How, or at least have you gone into that area? That is to say, I mean, I forget how many community associations there are, but I suppose it's, well, it's more than the, the number of ridings. And so we're getting up there, uh, 20, 30, 40, 
all together. And of course, the central ones are very, can be very enthusiastic. What's mm -hmm. your experience there? Yeah, we, we like, we really like working with community associations and all kinds of groups in the community. Um, our section at the city has its own outreach person. Uh -huh. um, and um, I would say that's, um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not entirely uh, unheard of that um, uh, a, a section in the city will have uh, an outreach person, but it's not very common. And um, I think it's it's very good that we do. Uh, so we have a big mailing list uh, with that outreach person um, that sends out regular news and um, to some extent works social media, though social media you have to be a bit careful, of course, on social media. But um, but it, it's great that we have um, a person, uh, you know, distinct from the central city communications that's able to do this. And more specifically, John, to your question um, on, um, you know, on community associations, recently on the resiliency side, and I work more on the emissions cutting side, but on the resiliency side, uh, we've had um, a, an outreach process on resiliency where we worked through CAFES, which is the community associations for um, environmental excellence um, or environmental sustainability, I should say. Uh, we got them to be a partner in um, the public hearings we had on resiliency. And they were um, leading some of the discussions. So, um, so we kind of like that. And, um, you know, we acknowledge that uh, in many cases, people will prefer to hear from a fellow community member uh, as opposed to somebody who's an employee at, you know, employee for the city. And uh, as much as, <laughs> as much as I think uh, we should be good enough, well, you know, it's who you know, and you know, do you see them all the time? So working through community associations is, uh, um, yeah, we, we, we are actively doing that. I'm very proud to say. I'm glad to hear that, thank you. All right, uh, next is um, Bob Jones and we got uh, Peter Bolkowski on uh, uh, on tap. Go ahead, Bob. Hi, Mike, uh, thanks for your presentation. This is a little bit off uh, your topic, but not far off, I don't think. Uh, as we all know, the landfills are getting uh, heavily used and filled and people are looking for alternates to uh, get rid of the garbage. and. Uh, over the decades that I've been sort of following this, I've seen many, many references to how great, great the Europeans do in incinerating their garbage and recovering heat from it and heating buildings nearby and blah, 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 and so on. And so they have no landfill problems. Now I've heard lately that this option may now be off the table because of pollution and energy use. And I just wondered if you could comment on whether this incineration of garbage option is still out there. Yeah, I think um, I think it is out there. I'll I'll um, I'll get started by saying that um, four years ago the city was part of a European Union exchange, and we went to Malmo, Sweden, um, paid for by the European Union, by the way, um, and so I saw their incinerator. Um, and I did better than just seeing their incinerator. We went around it, I saw it operating, um, and I found an operator who spoke English and I talked to him uh, out of the earshot of anybody else, which is the way you need to do things sometimes. <laughs> and um, I said, I looked at him in the eye, I said, how many forced outages do you have in a year? And the answer was four or five. Oh, that's a bit of a high number. Uh, to my mind, the answer should be one every other year or something like that. This was the garbage getting getting burned on a walking bed incinerator, and we could actually look through sight glasses and see the garbage getting burned. Um, and I said, so 
how do you get it going again um, if, um, you know, if you have a forced outage? And he said, well, we fill it with, uh, fill it with garbage and cover the garbage with fuel oil and throw in some burning racks. So that, that, those two things gave me a little bit of pause, not that I'm necessarily against it, um, but, um, you know, the, the, We've got to watch also watch the, the kind of the grass is greener thinking on this. Um, I, as somebody who works mostly on getting emissions down, I want to see the emissions balance. So I would like to see, um, you know, net emissions from burning the garbage and, you know, productively using the heat, which is a good thing, I admit, uh, versus um, other options to handle the solid waste and what the emissions look like with that so and and i think the big you know i'll, I'll defer a little bit until i see actual numbers and can look at how they were generated but i think the big issues on the one hand if you're landfilling the organic material in the garbage will create methane which is a potent greenhouse gas so all landfills even the best ones emit some methane and quite a bit so that's bad on that side uh, also, you'll you'll bury some stuff that might have some value. Uh, so, you know, notwithstanding recycling and waste diversion before before the landfill. On the other hand, um, you know, with incineration, all the plastic is going to become net greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so that's kind of the other side of the ledger. Um, however, with incineration, you are going to recover metals. I did notice that when I went to Melmo is, you know, all the, all the metal that went in there, uh, came out with the, with the ash and they were recovering metal. So that struck me as a benefit. So I would, all this to say, I'd just like to, just like to see the, the, the benefit netted out and, and understand that, uh, really well. And I think as a community, that's what we need to do. Thanks. Okay, and I've asked uh, Richard uh, to step step up. Uh, uh, <clears throat> as it seems like Peter Balkowski, who had actually three questions, has gone offline. The I'm next. Online. Oh, you're still online. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Then you're <laughs> on deck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, integrated modeling is great. Uh, how do you intend to compel everyone, and I mean everyone? To follow your plan, what are the costs going to be to retrofit residences, be it single family homes, uh, high rise apartments that are uh, gas heated, high rise apartments that are electrically resistive heating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a few questions there. Um, so how do we compel? Um, as a municipality, in many cases, we can't. We can talk to other levels of government with buildings that's basically the province, um, you know, longer term, we could look at buildings that have, um, uh, that have higher emissions and we can, we do have some latitude uh, to require reductions in emissions. Um, so that, you know, as a pollution reduction initiative, um, but, and then we also developed the high performance development standard and council's thinking about that, but if we can get that through, that would that would improve new buildings beyond building code. Um, but that's about it. Uh, the cost specifically all went into the model. I'm not good on breaking out the cost by each measure. Uh, but overall, what I can tell you about the model is that um, um, the the costs were estimated to do everything to get to net zero community wide. Um, people have had understanding that this this cost isn't a cost directly to the taxpayer; it's a community cost. Uh, the cost is about three percent of GDP annually, uh, which is similar to what we pay on defense. Uh, but unlike defense, it has a payback, so uh, it has a net. Uh, positive net present value, which means as an investment decision, it's something you would do. So, you know, uh, 
some people concerned about costs have been been worried about kind of the headline number and perhaps had some sticker shock about it. Uh, however, if you understand it's across the community and has a positive net present value, I think the story on it is more or less a good one. And I'm sorry, I don't have that, Peter, I don't have that split out by each of the 35 measures. And and the thing is that the model's integrated, so we don't want cherry picking, right? You know, everything has to kind of come together. Like somebody, somebody said to me once that uh, the cost of active transportation infrastructure is expensive and doesn't appear to have a lot of emissions reductions. Why don't we just forget it? And the answer to that is, if you don't improve active transportation, fewer people take transit. And now all of a sudden you have a transit system not carrying as many people and and buses that aren't as full. And you know, you can imagine the implications. It's integrated. So <laughs> be careful, be careful cherry picking. And not that people do it intentionally, but be careful trying to pick the best measures out because then the integration starts to unravel and and the results don't don't come to the fore. But if you're going to retrofit everybody's older house, the owners have to pay for it. And so mm. if you call it cherry picking, they got to pay the bills. And considering mm. the circumstance right now, people are having real difficulty even getting a house or a home. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think everybody's circumstance is a bit different. Um, yeah, certainly with new owners, for sure. How are you going to tell, um, you know, new younger owners of a house that are mortgaged up to the eyeballs to take on more debt? Um, yeah, I agree. That looks tough. Uh, on the other hand, if if it's a place where people have lived for a long time and are financially secure and can use uh, our better buildings program, where the, the cost of the retrofit goes on the property tax bill so that after they leave, they're not continuing to pay off a loan for something they don't get benefit from, that can help. So yeah, definitely, Peter, we don't have all the answers on that one yet. Thank you. Okay, um, Richard, can you go ahead? And we have uh, Raymond Lurie on deck. Our, I'll, I'll just mention there's uh, in the written comments there's uh maybe oh no i'm sorry nope nope never mind that um yeah. but i think that's right i think you got the right order go ahead richard okay sorry. thank you uh thanks for the talk mike i i like the directions of the city and and uh where things are going i'm just wondering tonight enbridge is having a meeting on expanding the ability to transfer uh, natural gas around the city and over to uh, Elmer and so forth. And I'm just wondering, is this in, uh, in keeping with Ottawa's plan for a green future? So we, um, that's a tricky question on a project by project basis. So um, the city believes, because we believe in using some renewable natural gas, believes we'll still need a gas system. Uh, we just believe it'll be be basically smaller. Um, so we commented, for example, um, at a leave to construct hearing a couple of years ago um, and said, okay, if the uh, Enbridge want, wanted to replace the pipe on San Laura Boulevard, and our comment was, um, okay, if it, if it needs to be replaced because of reliability reasons, all right, um, but otherwise, just push off on doing that because, because we're hoping the demand is going to go down. So that's kind of always our position on this right now. The we think the value proposition would from waiting would be that we might replace a 12 inch steel pipe with a 12 inch steel pipe right now. Uh, you know, in in a dozen or more years, if you can wait that long, the pipe size might be half and and the construction job instead of being digging might just be um, directional tunnel boring at less expense and and you know less disruption from delaying so we're really pushing to kind of 
make the existing infrastructure last as long as they can and make sure the case that it needs replacement is actually there. So that's that's more or less the city's position on these kind of things. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, Raymond Lurie, uh, do you wanna go ahead? And uh, Claude, did you want to uh, turn your comment into a question? I think you've, you, you've made a, a couple of interesting comments. But you're um, on deck. Okay, sounds good. Uh, hi, Mike. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, we've, for those who don't know, Mike and I have had lots of discussions on various topics like this. But uh, back to the question of the, the overall cost. So uh, one comment before I ask my question is that the um, uh, Mike is absolutely right that uh, much of the, the, the numbers are being bandied about are they seem very large. Uh, but there's a return. So, so uh, most of these projects will provide savings. It's not like, to, you know, building a road where the road is built and there's no revenue from, uh, from the road, right? So uh, these are investments that are going to bring back some, some return. Uh, but the, the specific question, Mike, is um, you were talking about the increases in the amount of electricity we need and that kind of stuff. And um, one thing that struck me when I looked at the numbers is that uh, currently we have about 25% of our heating that's provided through uh, conventional uh, electrical resistive heating, which is not very efficient. And um, if we are to replace uh, gas with um, with heat pumps, well, heat pumps are about three times more efficient than natural gas. So do the numbers you have in terms of electricity uh, uh, demand in, include the fact that uh, we could recoup a lot of electricity by um, by retrofitting uh, resistive heating um, uh, equipment uh, with um, with uh, heat pumps and uh, and um, that heat pumps are much more efficient than uh, natural gas? Yeah, the short of it is that's in there. So one of the pathway documents that was used to build the model includes conservation for both gas and electricity. So um, now it it will eventually need updating, um, you know, because the heat pumps have improved. Um, but um, but basically, yes, it's in there. And it's an interesting question because recently the municipalities uh, got the Clean Air Partnership to uh, produce a, a study of how much electricity uh, demand is going to increase in the province to 2050. And the municipality's number for an end percentage annual increase uh, on the bulk transmission system is about half the provinces. So uh, if you uh, aggregate the demand increases that the municipal plans see, and keeping in mind that some of the cities aren't as cold as, as Ottawa, like it's weighted a little bit more towards the uh, greater Toronto area, um, our number is about 1% a year for everything, for buildings, for electrification of transport, et cetera. Um, and the province's number is two. So we will see, um, but I, I, I would bet on our number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen, I've seen many cases where people uh, seem to forget that, uh, as we replace fossil fuels as a, you know, primary energy source, we don't need to replace, uh, kilojoule per kilojoule, right? There's yeah, <laughs> there's right. much more efficiency in electric uh, versions, right? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, with that, Claude, uh, you're you're up, and uh, Jeff Strong, you're on deck. So I'll rephrase this into a question, but I'll start out by saying you made that comment about that building with the balconies that there's it's very difficult to retrofit that. And I made a comment that uh, you could face the building, although that would turn the balconies into um, inside space. And then you create a whole new set of questions on how to heat it and would mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. moisture get trapped, et cetera. And a lot of people don't want to give up their balconies. Yeah. And, and so the other thing I did was uh, I, I thought about that I had a photo from my uh, March trip to see my French relatives. And uh, my cousin was very proud of the upgrade that's uh, taking place on his in his apartment, not his building, but in the complex. They're moving building by building to upgrade it to this approximately five inch thick. Um, I, I was able to get a, close enough to a piece of it to dig my fingers into it. It appeared to be something like a high density fiberboard. That's what we yeah. would call it around here. 
and uh, it will be painted. Uh, and it's rather undramatic when it's finished, but this photo is uh, showing that there's a, a blank cement wall that's radiating a lot of heat and absorbing a lot of heat during the summer that's now going to have a, a nice insulation layer. And mm -hmm. so um, uh, I'll phrase this whole question into a, a rather impolite question. At what point do the powers that be declare that a, a building uh, multifamily or a house it's just too inefficient and they just condemn the property you must do this upgrade um, and we'll help you find the financing or the mechanism to pay for it but you know at some point do we just um, try to get rid of this old infrastructure that just won't fit the grade in the coming century yeah I, I think that might be the way it goes it's uh it's it is it is kind of the way to ask the question in a way. Um, and I think that like the North American precedent would be New York City, where where horrendously bad buildings are starting to get what you would more or less consider a fine put on them uh, for their for their emissions level. And um, you know, and I don't make the call on stuff like that. That's obviously gonna be a political question, but um, but it it might be something to do. And and I think it's the kind of thing that if it's um, if it's done right, really kind of like energy evolution itself could have a net benefit because then people could plan. They could say, okay, I've got this building, which I understand is is a really poor performer and and that's not gonna, you know, there's gonna be a requirement that I do something about that. And people can start to plan what they do with it um, as opposed to, Kind of leaving it hanging and and who knows what happens um and but i mean that again that'll be that'll be something that um we'll have to get considered at the political level i think thank you okay and uh we've got uh jeff strong on now with uh peter mckinnon you're on deck Yes, uh, Mike, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I apologies, I came in late due to another commitment. But are you aware that this renewable gas contributes uh, carbon emissions to the atmosphere similar to natural gas and about the same amounts as far as I know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the point of combustion, it does. That's right. But it's considered renewable because it's, it's not a fossil fuel. Um, and it's considered to be emissions more or less neutral um, because it's part of the, the surface car carbon cycle of the earth, meaning um, uh, humans consume food, uh, we create human manure, and our human manure goes back to being gas that we consume. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's how it's explained as being basically carbon neutral. There is... Um, when, when you combust something, um, you know you you definitely have uh, some oxides of nitrogen produced, and that's that is a greenhouse gas. That's a consideration. Um, I am starting to read stuff about um, uh, zero uh, NOx uh, combustion, which I find interesting and helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean the um, the the sewage sludge at Ropec. Uh, will exist uh, and become oxidized, ultimately, I believe, regardless of whether we make renewable natural gas out of it or we don't. So right now, for example, uh, municipalities that don't digest their gas are doing land application. And my belief it, you know, goes on to crops that are, are non-direct food crops, they're feed crops. And most of that material is becoming oxidized, so the CO2 is going into the atmosphere. Yes, but I would suggest that you not use the term carbon neutral because it's not, or you'll have environmental people jumping all over you. <laughs> but I appreciate uh, what you're saying anyway. Yep, fair enough. Okay, and with that, we'll, we'll go over to uh, Peter uh, McKinnon. And if, in fact, uh, David Cardell, you can take all your comments and turn it into a question, I'll, I'll give you some time. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, thanks, Art. Uh, Mike, I, I apologize I wasn't able to join your presentation, but I've certainly uh, been involved in here listening to the discussion. 
I had a, a quick question and a thought I'm wondering about. Uh, you, As you know, Ottawa has created a smart city plan. Uh, they were in the midst of updating this during the pandemic, and then the crew got all reassigned for other reasons related to the emergency. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand the smart city plan is not going forward at the moment. I'm just wondering, does your your mission in regard to you know greenhouse gases and of course the Ottawa climate um, program itself, how does that relate to the smart city plan? Because smart cities are all supposed to be about reducing these things too, as in greenhouse yeah. gases. It's you know it's a good question and it's right like how it got dropped. Um, to my mind, smart city is kind of um, an envelope that catches a lot of um, a lot of smart activity. Um, and I think we're we're doing some of it anyway. Like the benchmarking is metadata that we use to say how how well buildings are performing. Um, you know, to my mind, that meets the definition of smart. Um, so it you know that would be an instance where we're doing it. When I worked in the building engineering and energy management group, we had um, uh, a web-based aggregator of all the building automation systems, um, and we could use that to track problems in in real time even. And I've I've used that for retrofitting. I like I would also consider that to be pretty darn smart, um, mm -hmm. even if it hasn't been captured into an initiative. And, and initiatives can be good too. Um, but all this to say, I think like I think we're doing some of it, even if even if we haven't kind of pulled it together and and put a bow on it. But is it do you do you see um, this is being integrated into a plan by the city, or is it are, are you sort of working still in silos? Well, um, I think, yeah, right now we're still working in silos. Um, I mean, I like the I always like the idea of integration because you get ideas moving across and um, you get ways to share resources. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think a good one to my mind would be um, actually the best example we have would be the city GIS system, which is both uh, city and public facing and has all kinds of data and info on it. Um, you know, I didn't, I could have mentioned it today. It's got, um, it's got a GIS map for geothermal on it that gives you an idea of where open loop geothermal will work well and where there's trunk sewers uh, for sewer waste heat. Um, so, and that's public facing. And the idea is that anybody who wants to do something can go on there and take a look and, start to get ideas and develop them and then start to engage with whoever they need to engage with. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay. With that, um, our final question, or at least comment perhaps from um, David Cardell. And after that, we will ask Jean to thank our speaker. David. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Well, I, I don't really have a question. You already answered it. But uh, yeah, this, the city uh, and municipalities all over the planet, uh, all over Europe, all over the United States, all over Canada, uh, are going to be implementing central geo systems predominantly. If we need to replace all the gas lines with something, they're going to be water lines. And water, uh, even when it's cold, uh, mm -hmm. will supply all of the heat requirements to any building that we plummet to. So. Yeah, those things are already uh, coming down the pipe and the transition is well underway and that's that's the direction we're going. I mean, you suggested that the city already have plans for open loop geo systems and of course there's plenty of water uh, in the Ottawa Valley. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Uh, no, just yeah, absolutely. Okay, and with that comment, I'd like to uh, turn this over to to uh, Jean, to uh, thank our speaker. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Mike, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. I 
as a, an Ottawa resident, I'm delighted to know that uh, Ottawa is working to make things better for everybody. I know that they declared this a climate emergency and, and no, I'm very glad that they have people who are working towards reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as a city. So this is just wonderful and that there are success stories that are happening. So with that, I'm just very delighted with what you've been able to show us today. And uh, so thank you for that. Well, I'm I'm delighted to be employed on the city's behalf doing it. It's uh, it's a great thing to be able to do. Well. That's wonderful. As a former civil servant, yes, being being employed and being able to do something for everybody is is really very gratifying. So, thank you for that. For those of you who are still here on this presentation or are listening to things later, um, I would invite you to look at our website, CanadianCore.com. On that particular site, if you look at the Stay Informed section, you will be able to register for that and get the links to this particular talk when it goes up on our YouTube, and as well as being able to look at other talks that we have had. You can do a search on the, the video screen and you can see what talks we've had, and there have been a large number of them, many of which would feed in nicely to what Mike has talked about as well. Um, so it's really nice. Um, system to look at that look at our website you can find out more information about us as an organization and it and uh and if you're interested in becoming involved with our particular organization you can get membership information there as well as how to um subscribe and 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 get onto our mailing lists and so on so with that i'd like to say thank you very much for coming and this has been a, a wonderful presentation so thank you <laughs>